Okay. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, organizers, for giving us the chance to share with you uh, part of the material that we have developed in two years of very hard work. I'm here talking, but I'm the representative of, of a big consortium, very big, uh, a very strong team that have uh, been developing the Esponiria project. Um, Okay, sorry. Okay, so I'm Carlos Llano. The, the title of the presentation is European Recovery with Our Neighbors in Arms. Uh, you will see it's a joint paper, a joint presentation with Julian Perez and Miguel Angel. But as I said, I feel like I'm representing the whole uh, EDA, uh, EDA consortium. Um, the starting point. Here is to present a little bit more, say something about this Esponiria project. It's a very large project. We have been working two years. The aim of this project is to uh, set light on the interregional relationships in Europe. Europe conceived in a general perspective, including the EU27, UK, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Norway. And we have been estimating flows mainly. I mean, there is a part of the project that is basically producing a statistics, new statistics on interregional flows of goods, services, knowledge, capital, and people. And then we have also uh, estimated and extended the largest interregional input output table available at this, at this moment in Europe, what we call the Euregio 2017, which has been developed in collaboration with the GRC in Seville. Uh, then, this framework is used for estimating, quantifying different scenarios. Scenarios that some of them were mm, foreseen at the beginning of the project, some others are completely new, the COVID and the Ukrainian war. So we have uh, estimated the impact of the European Green Deal, the new globalization conceived as a, as a euphemism of protectionism and, and protectionism measures adopted against the European Union. Then uh, we focus today on the effect of the COVID-19 and the next generation funds, as well as the Ukrainian conflict. Here you see the, sorry, about that. Okay. Here you see the, 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 the symbols of all the, the institutions that have collaborated in this project. So uh, the context of COVID, all of us, we know perfectly this context. We know that the COVID represents the largest impact suffered by the European economy since the Second World War. Uh, we also know that the next generation uh, funds are expected to be an uh, unprecedented package of measures adopted at the European level with uh, two different uh, aims, two different goals to, pr to promote the recovery of the European Union, but as, at the same time, to emphasize the, uh, the dimension, the di digital and green dimension, and the resilience dimension of the European economy. The purpose of this uh, scenario in the Esponiria project was using these interregional input output tables to analyze the impact of these two shocks, the negative shock and the positive. Um, I want just to remark that the aim is not to predict. What we want is to create scenarios for the discussion. So we are not going to uh, get stick to the numbers that we obtain, although they are very relevant. We want to create pictures for the debate. So here you see uh, two important uh, figures to start with the discussion. First is what we know about the next generation funds. The next generation funds are uh, attributed at the country level. Here we are going to focus on the grants. And the formula used by the European Commission and the, the members is complex, includes different variables, such as the impact of the COVID on the 2020 uh, GDP, unemployment rate, and the income per capita. What I want you to see here is that the next generation funds relative to the GDP of the countries has a clear negative relationship with the income per capita. So the allocation of the funds at the country level are um, pro-cohesion. Pro -cohesion. Uh, in addition, once that we have uh, asked to the countries to reveal 
the preference, where they want to allocate these funds. Uh, considering the six pillars and with certain constraints, uh, even the share that they have to, to, to devote to the green transition and the, to the digital transformation, this is the whole picture that we get in Europe. So most of the funds are going to the green transition and the digital, also to the smart, and cohesion is just one of the pillars, one of the six pillars. So I want to remark that in origin, the next generation funds are not a cohesion type of program. And cohesion is just one of the other. Then uh, a word related with the methodology that we have used. First, as I said, we are going to compute the sorry. Sorry. Uh, first, the negative shock. So the starting point is to depart from the official national ac uh, accounts that are provided by the Eurostat. And then based on the input output model that we have, we estimate the sectoral national impact by demand and supply. This is a good thing of the, this input output framework. We are covering the whole world uh, and the, yeah. the two dimensions of the economy, the supply and the demand. And then we go to the regional sectoral allocation of the impacts at the sectoral level. Then regarding the positive shock, the point of departure is this national allocation of the funds. We are going to focus just on the grants. And we are using Bruegel data set that is collecting and putting all this uh, in a very clear way. Then the purpose is to make a, an ad hoc allocation of the funds by sectors and regions within each one of the countries so we can match the total maximum amount allocated to each one of the countries. And we use three different potential theoretical uh, distribution of these funds. The first one is the statue quo. That is, we take the funds and we allocate these funds by sectors and regions, considering the structure that is observed in the 2017 uh, Euregio dataset, considering the structure of the investment. So we want to use the, um, the, the business as usual before the pandemic in order to allocate the funds. Then this, the damage restitution criteria is um, is the one that is based on applying the same formula that the Commission applied to the countries to apply them at the regional level within countries. So we are going to take into account the income per capita and the damage suffered by each one of the regions in 2017. And the third, third one is future growth. And this is probably the one that much better the philosophy of the next generation, which is a kind of industrial policy, new type of industrial policy, where uh, countries are expected to allocate the funds mainly in digital, mainly in green, and mainly in resilient. So um, with this, here you see the picture of the first shock, the negative shock. This is the impact suffered by the countries and the regions of the COVID, sorry. Okay, the impact. As you can see, most of the, or the largest impact uh, uh, appears in Italy and Spain, but also in Ireland, Iceland, and some regions in Lithuania and Norway. Once that we go to the uh, second uh, shock, the positive shock, the allocation of the next generation funds, you are going to see that in general, the blocks corresponds to the national allocation. This is something that is given by the, by, by the, by the commission. Okay? But then once that you focus on the regions within each one of the countries, you are going to see differences, for example, if you focus in damage restitution, is the one more pro cohesion because it will give money to the ones that have suffered most uh, impacts and usually are the ones that are more exposed to deterrence and at the same time are the ones that are uh, uh, less resilient with a lower income level. Here, for instance, Madrid is not there, Paris is not there, Brussels is not there. But if you focus in these others, you are going to see that the capital cities and the main cities in the, each one of the main regions in each one of the countries will appear and attract the largest part of the next generation. So they are pushing against cohesion. Here you, you can see the mix of the negative and the positive shock. So, uh, and here we are going to have a net positive effects in some regions that appear in, sorry. Okay. That appear in green, but most of the most of the regions appear in yellow, orange, or red. This means that next generation funds, the grants, 
are not able to cover the negative shock produced by the cobalt. And you will see some large impacts in some regions like Ireland, Norway, or uh, Iceland. You can also see uh, heterogeneity. You can see Portugal, which is better off after receiving the next generation. OK, uh, conclusions of this part is that the next generation funds, the grants, are not able to offset the negative shock of the COVID, which is the largest suffered by the European Union after the Second World War. We are seeing also the, that the Eastern European uh, regions are the one taking more profit from the next generation funds. Uh, also, we are seeing many regions having net negative effects, and the ones that are suffering most are the ones in Ireland, Iceland, Norway, and the UK. And certain criteria, uh, certain criteria for all the allocation of the next of the next generation funds will produce uh, uh, divergence, will produce, will go against the issue. We also have to say that uh, this uh, analysis is, is limited. We are using a static approach. We are not considering the loans. We are not even considering the national and regional measures that have been adopted. So we are just focusing on the grants. But at the same time, we are not considering other shocks that we have suffered just after this uh, scenario was produced. For example, the, uh, the, the, the war between Russia and Ukraine, but also the inflation uh, issue that we are suffering, the potential uh, of interest rates, etc. Et so now we enter in the set this uh, potential uh, game changer uh, in what we have analyzed this, uh, till now, which is the uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, conflict. Uh, sadly, uh, the context is very well known by all of us. Uh, I don't have to spend much time on that. Just to say that I have the problematic role to play that I'm going to just explain the economic impact of something that is uh, having a heavy human uh, cost. So I, I'm, I feel sorry to have to talk about the impact, the economic impact outside Russia, outside Ukraine. So I, I'm not going to spend too much time on Russia and Ukraine today. Yeah, and I apologize for that. So the focus here is to use the, this input-output analysis for uh, guessing this, uh, this impact uh, on every region and any country in the world. Um, the, again, a warning. We are not trying to forecast the results. What we are trying to do is to draw pictures that are useful for the political discussion. And I will try to uh, elaborate more on this in a bit. So just to contextualize the, the impact. Uh, first, to say that uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, all together are, I mean, Russia mainly is a very big country. It is the largest country in terms of surface. It's a big country in terms of population. But in terms of GDP, they are medium sized. It's below uh, France. It's a little bit higher than Spain. But the risk comes also from the strategic uh, product mix that they generate and they export to the world. And we all know how uh, the European Union is exposed to the, uh, to the energy imports, uh, the imports of energetic uh, uh, products from Russia, and how they are very relevant on the production and export of metals, uh, titanium, nickel, palladium, but also agricultural products in the case of Ukraine. In addition, just a word about the sanctions. Yesterday, we had another package approved. Just to say, we are including here sanctions that have never been applied to any country in the world. Uh, and uh, we are covering uh, sanctions to the flow of goods, to the services, to capital, and also measures against specific firms, specific banks, specific people. This is something completely new. And it's a coordinated measure by most of the major countries. Just a word on the methodology. Uh, here we are going to use also input-output analysis. We are going to split the analysis in two parts. The first one is going to be a quantity analysis or quantity effect that you can relate with international trade. And then the price effect. This is going to come from the inflation, from the dimension of inflation. And the inflation is, to gener is going to generate a second round effect in consumption that will end up generating an additional 
reduction in uh, GDP. So at the end, aggregating the quantity effect with the, this second round consumption effect coming from inflation, we have the total effect. This total effect is the maximum total effect that will hold, will, 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 opt, will, will be obtained if we keep our hypothesis during one year. They are going to be strong hypotheses, but as you will see, they are becoming very, very realistic. Uh, then, in order to moderate this maximum impact, we are considering two different temporal intensities, so we can obtain a moderate and a severe alternative uh, uh, message. Okay, digging deeper on the methodology. What is the quantity effect? The quantity effect is, the, is coming from the well-known uh, hypothetical extraction method in input-output. We are eliminating two countries. We are isolating two countries. So Russia and Ukraine during one year will not export or import any good or any service to any country in the world. It's like remove those from the framework. And we compute the uh, effect in every region and every country at the sectoral level at the same time. Then regarding the inflation, we are going to use a cost push type of analysis where we compute, we observe, sorry, we observe during the, th the three first weeks after the war, the rise in the, in the prices of commodities, the commodities that are produced by Russia and Ukraine. And then we compute how much this uh, prices will impact the rest of the sectors, regions, and countries in the world. And from there, so we, we compute the inflation impact, okay, here. Then we compute the adjustment in consumption. And taking into account that those products are primary products, we are keeping constant the rents, we are going to have a reduction in the, in the consumption of all the rest, all the other products apart from those essential products. Here you see the exposure of every region in Europe to Russia in 2017. This is coming from the uh, input output tables before simulation. As you can see, there is a clear gradient, sorry. There's a, a very clear gradient coming from the east to the west, from the coldest part of Europe to the, to the uh, warmer part of, of Europe. Uh, it's gonna be present here in all my presentation. Here you see the effect, uh, the, the, the imports, okay? This is the exposure of the imports. And, and you will see that the exposure to imports is lower. It's lower, but not, not lower, sorry. It's more heterogeneous from the uh, spatial viewpoint. Here you see the impacts coming from the simulation. Here you see the uh, quantitative effect, and here the inflation effect. Here you see this gradient that I was explaining to you before. So the, the closer you are to uh, Russia and Ukraine, the larger the effect in terms of trade. This is linked to what we will expect from gravity equation. And here you see uh, the effect in inflation where the effect also uh, agglomerates in the Eastern European regions, but as well affects some southern regions uh, in uh, Portugal and uh, Spain. Okay, here you see the Im impact in GDP uh, due to inflation. Here we aggregate the quantity and the price effects. And here will be the conclusions. The worst scenario for the European Union will be a minus 1.8 moderation in the current European GDP uh, growth, causing 3.7 million jobs losses and representing three uh, uh, percentage points additional to the inflation that we had before the war. In the moderate, the most moderate scenario, this is minus 0.6, 0.8 million jobs, and 1.3 additional inflation points. Uh, the quantity effects prevails over the price effects, and within the quantity effect, indirect uh, overpass the direct effects. And just one last comment, putting all this together. So here you see uh, the COVID next generation, the COVID plus next generation, and the Ukrainian conflict. So you are going to see that in general, considering the European Union, the COVID represents two times more than the maximum effect that we obtain for the uh, Ukrainian conflict. But once that you mix the COVID plus the next generation, in general, they are more or less the same. But when you focus in some specific regions, let's say Brussels and Lille, 
uh, you will obtain very similar results, but they are very different in terms of resilience. When you add some other regions, the, the largest impacts are obtained in uh, Ireland, Hungary, and Norway, then London and Ile de France are affected very much, but they have very different also levels of resilience. And then concluding here, for instance, the case of uh, Cyprus, where, we, where the positive effect ob obtained by the COVID plus next, gener next generation will vanish one, uh, with the Ukrainian conflict, because uh, Cyprus is the one receiving the largest impact. And with this, some conclusions. No room for uh, naivety. The, the impact of COVID is larger than the one of the Ukrainian conflict, but uh, Putin has changed the rules of the game. Now we are facing, we are searching a new steady state. Probably we are not going to get back to the new normal that we have before the war. And we are in search for a new steady state. Uh, this idea of the cold gradient, the closer you are to the, to the east, to the Russia and Ukraine, the larger the impact. And we are exposed again to the dilemma between guns and versus butter. Uh, are we moving towards uh, a new Cold War? Should we prioritize the European Open Strategy Autonomy? Should we accelerate or delay the European Green Deal? Those are questions that are open for the debate. Thank you very much.